Ready? Good morning. I'm Councilmember Chaim Day, Chair of the Committee on Veterans. I'm joined today with Councilmember Ben Kalos, Chair of the Committee of Contracts. Thank you all for joining us uh, today uh, during this month of November, just after Veterans Day. I would like to especially thank the members of the armed forces who protect our way of living and all the, of the freedoms uh, we are afforded. Uh, I would also like to extend a warm welcome to the new commissioner of DVS, Lieutenant Colonel James Hendon, although he is not uh, joined with, uh, with us here today. I look forward to working with the new commissioner um, going forward to better the city for our veterans and their family members. Today's hearing is one, of, uh, is one that we have had um, in, in important to our advocates, which is important to our advocates and veteran service organizations. The committee today will be hearing testimony on topic of DBS's uh, contracting ability and process. We will look at what contracting ability exists within DBS's structure and how contracts are currently procured for and through DBS. As procurement is a large part of our city agencies providing effective program and programs and services, this is an important issue to be transparent about our veterans and their advocates. In 2016, the early days of DVS, DVS and Department of Citywide Administrative Services, or DCAS, agreed upon a, mem a memorandum of understanding, which in other words, MOU, that allowed DCAS to provide DVS with certain support and guidance functions. This included the use of DCAS's citywide procurement line of service. As part of DCAS's uh, citywide procurement line of service, DVS assigned a liaison to DCAS. Our understanding is that the ini initiation of the procurement process required that DVS submit a completed requisition form and approved fiscal certif certification to the DCAS citywide procurement line of service. Under the MOU, DCAS performed a variety of tasks for DVS including reviewing the scope of service and pricing documents prepared by DVS, preparing, reviewing, and approaching uh, required procurement documents, representing DVS at public hearings, and creating purchase order documents and DCAS purchase order system, amongst other things. Since DVS has now been active for almost three years, the agency began to procure its own contracts instead. From its establishment, DVS has held 10 active contracts, totaling $2.1 million. This has included the provision of professional computer services, buying office furniture, veteran employment, and VetConnect NYC, which we discussed at uh, one of our last hearings. Uh, currently, there are only two active contracts with DVS. Uh, these contracts total of $1.7 million uh, and are a, a Syracuse University for VetConnect NYC and Payer Alliance for Veterans Employment, LLC, for the veteran uh, employment. Both contracts are run through DBS, which indicates that DBS now has the ability to procure contracts. This being the case, this committee would like to better understand how DBS does so and what process for procurement is, what other agencies are involved, as well as what barriers exist. Although it seems to have the ability to procure, DBS still lacks a chief contracting officer, which advocates have called for year after year. Having a chief contracting officer could expedite the process of procurements and ensure that funds are distributed to CBOs and providers more quickly and efficiently. To date, advocates and stakeholders have highlighted DBS, DBS's lack of funding and staff as the major reason for DBS not having a capacity for contracting effectively. Thus, the goal of this hearing is to examine the prospect of changing DVS's contract, contracting cap capability so they can secure contracts more effectively, as, we, as, uh, as well as uh, to look at the prospect of creating a chief contracting officer to distribute funds to providers. I look forward to discussing this matter in depth today uh, joining uh, with the Committee on Contracts and my co-chair, uh, Councilmember Ben Kalos. Uh, I would like to acknowledge, um, well, no colleagues here yet, um, so I'd like to, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee staff, uh, Nuzat Saudri, Kevin Katowski, Andrew Wilbur, and John Russell, as well as my Citywide Veterans Director, that you all know, um, Joe Bello, for, for their help in uh, helping with this hearing. Uh, I'd now 
ask my co-chair, Councilmember Ben Kalos, to give his opening remarks. I want to start with a huge uh, thank you to uh, the chair of the Committee on Veteran Services, uh, Chaim Deutsch. Uh, I have the opportunity to work with him in this committee now as contracts chair and also as uh, he is the chair of the uh, Jew uh, committee, uh, the, the Jewish caucus. And uh, wherever he leads, he does amazing work, groundbreaking work, and we're so glad to have him in these leadership roles. Uh, I want to thank those of you who are in the audience today and I want to uh, thank Chaim for his partnership in social media outreach on Veterans Day. Uh, his team created an amazing video. We created a graphic asking our veterans to come out and let us know, you served our country. How can our city serve you? And that's what I'm hoping that we can get into today. If you are uh, watching the live stream or you're watching at home, and it is within 72 hours of November 19th, 2019. We'd love to hear from you, and you can uh, submit your testimony uh, to us in whatever length, in whatever format you like. You can also tweet me at Ben Kalos. You can tweet Chaim at? At Chaim Deutsch. At Chaim Deutsch. And uh, and. In terms of the testimony, you can submit it to correspondence at council.nyc.gov. Uh, I'm joined here by uh, uh, Daniel Gorman. He is an MSW candidate from Fordham University. He's currently placed in our district office as part of his MSW field placement. Uh, he is also a veteran who served four years in the Navy and 16 years in the Army National Guard for a tw total of 20 years. I want to thank him for his service and continue to work with him on making sure these services are available. With, with the creation of the Department of Veteran Services in 2016, something that I was proud to vote on, uh, we now have an agency that can provide services to our veterans. And there's two ways to do it. It's either for you to staff up and hire a huge team of people to provide direct services from your agency, which frankly and honestly is my preference. I always believe government employees can do most things better. But in other instances, it can be very helpful to have partners in the community. I'm a particular fan of nonprofits over for profits. Not sure why we need to give anyone any profit on a government contract. Uh, that being said, uh, it can be challenging uh, to bring in contracts. Currently, you have about $2 million in contracts while we have about a million veterans in our city, plus their family members who need your support, which comes out to uh, a little less than about $2 per veteran, uh, which means we do need more support for our veterans than just $2 per veteran. And one of the questions we have today is, is the current framework that you have of using procurement through a different agency working? Or could you benefit from having your own uh, chief uh, contracting officer, what a lot of folks call in the slang a uh, ACO, agency chief con uh, contracting officer, and uh, what that would look like and how long we can get you to a place where you need to be? And then similarly, uh, as we're talking about this, what kinds of services do you believe the veterans need? What are you currently offering? And uh, let's just say you had $94 billion. Let's just say you had that. What would you spend it on to help our veterans? Uh, and as we enter this holiday season, Thanksgiving isn't too far away. We, we have a homeless crisis in our city and a portion of that crisis, a face of that crisis our, is our veterans. I don't ever want to see another uh, veteran on our street. We, we have a duty to care for them in the same way that they cared for our country. So I want to uh, thank you, uh, thank Chaim, and uh, I will pass it back to him uh, or our council to swear in the first panel. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chairman Deitch, Chairman Kalos, 
Members of the committees and advocates, my name is Adam Connolly and I am proud to serve as the Assistant Commissioner of Engagement and Community Services for the New York City Department of Veterans Services. I am joined today by Cassandra Alvarez, Associate Commissioner of Public-Private Partnerships at DVS. Commissioner Hendon, who is unable to attend this hearing, sends his regards. On behalf of the Commissioner and New York City Veterans, we would like to extend our appreciation to the committees for their continued advocacy and support. As always, DVS staff members are proud to meet council members at our Veteran Resource Centers to maintain our ongoing collaborations to better the New York City veterans community. Like those we serve, DVS adheres to a military training framework. We must first begin by crawling before we can walk or run. Under the guidance and expertise of Commissioner Sutton, we executed that crawl framework. In three short years, an agency that once operated in the mayor's office evolved into a standalone agency with approximately 44 employees. These employees, motivated by the mission to serve veterans, worked tire tirelessly to get DVS to the level and capacity that it is today. In this time, through the help of our sister agencies and staff members banding together, DVS was able to successfully procure both Vet Connect NYC and Pay for Success, each leading to notable progress aiding New York City veterans. As we now begin our walk phase, it would be helpful to break down our employment concentrations. Of our 44 current employees, approximately 44% are dedicated to the three programmatic lines of action. 19% are agency-wide specialists, 6% are executive, and 14% are administrative and operational support of the agency in areas such as budget, budget, HR, and legal services. DVS managed the contractual process for VetConnect NYC and pay for success initiatives. In light, of our limited administrative capabilities, we owe our success for approval of these contracts to DCAS and MOX as they provided invaluable advice and guidance to DVS through the procurement process. While DVS is currently exploring procurement methods for future initiatives, we are mindful of our current staffing. As we enter this new phase to better serve the New York City veteran community, we continue to work with our OMB partners to address any operational and staffing lines which might be necessary. Presently, each of DVS's current procurements have a staff member who takes on the role of the project lead in conjunction with their regular responsibilities. Because of the nature of the tasks, several DVS staff members, including the Deputy Commissioner, Chief of Staff, Associate Commissioner for Public-Private Partnerships, General Counsel, Assistant Commissioner for Operations and Administration, Budget Manager, and others assist that individual in reviewing the contractual language deadlines, correspondence, and other notable steps. As DVS increases its number of procurements, we are working with OMB to address any operational and staffing lines which might be necessary to maintaining our internal contracts. DVS is committed to working with and assisting the number of veteran service organizations and their ongoing advocacy in New York City. While we have not been made aware of any issues currently affecting interactions between contracting agencies and VSOs, we take the suggestions and information presented by our partners such as the New York City Veterans Advisory Board and the New York City Veterans Alliance deeply. As such, DVS is reviewing the most efficient ways to respond to any needs or issues the VSOs may have. As DVS continues its upward trajectory into this next chapter, we will continue to expand on the work we have done thus far as we seek new endeavors. We thank you for the ability to testify in the matter and look forward to addressing some of the topics discussed in the coming months. We are happy to address any questions you or the committee may have. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so in your testimony, you said while we have not uh, while we have not been made aware of any issues currently affecting interactions between contracting agencies and VSOs. Um, so you did mention currently. Were you ever made aware or do you have any knowledge that um, the CBOs have been asking your FBA to have their contracting done through DVS? And, and please let me clarify, sir, um, fully acknowledging our, the advocacy that's been happening regarding the ACO shop. Um, complaints from specific VSOs are what I was referring to in the testimony. Okay, so you are aware? 
aware of the advocacy for an ACO shop, yes, sir. Okay. And uh, what has, um, how has, how has DVS responded to that? Sorry. Uh, we're, that is an active part of our conversation right now with OMB addressing if the agency, which direction the agency should move in regarding contract procurement. Uh, currently, our deputy commissioner is our acting ACO uh, since he has extensive knowledge in these processes and in city government. So uh, when was the, like, the first time you were made aware, to the best of your knowledge, uh, that the VSOs have issues and have advocating um, for their contract being to be done in DVS? Yeah, sure. I think the, the VAB, in their, in their testimony uh, during their report, um, since I believe that they came before the Vet Veterans Alliance in mentioning that, um, I would assume that was the first time that they brought it to our attention that there was a need there. When was that? Approximately. I'm not sure. A year exactly, ago, two so years ago, three years I ago. I think it's been ongoing. The advocacy has been ongoing since our inception, so about two years. Two years ago. Mm -hmm. And and now you're saying that you're working on it. And let me see what you. So what happened for two years? We were just focusing on our ori original charter mandate and focusing on getting out into the community, serving our constituents, et cetera. So um, the Veterans Initiative currently is approximately is 2.8 million dollars. And you're aware that uh, year after year there, there is a, a veterans initiative in the New York City Council that... Um, yes, sir. Okay. So getting the veterans the vital services they need, and, you know, we cannot have a CBO or... V, uh, 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 um, we cannot have a uh, VSO say, oh, listen, I'm, I'm waiting for the funding to come in and right. I can't help you. And we all know that part of Vet Connect um, would refer to some of those VSOs, right? Um, and we rely on them to do a lot of a lot of the legwork, whether it's legal services, whether it's mental health resources. So, wh how do you think that affects um, the services that veterans should receive um, over the last two years, with the knowledge that there are issues uh, that have been brought to uh, to DVS about the funding process. Right, and I, I remember that testimony very well by our partners at the last hearing, sir, and thank you for uh, bringing that to my attention. And we, we all know at DVS how important these services are in this spe specific example, legal services, um, if I'm not mistaken. And we, o we realize we can always do more to support them. And our ongoing conversations uh, with OMB are constantly talking about what that looks like, what other ways can we advocate for uh, more money, and in this specific instance, um, what was recently announced was um, funding for legal services, which we are working on how we're going to procure that and, and divvy those funds out. So do you believe you could have done more over the last two years? I think we could, we could always do more, especially considering our constituency. So why hasn't DVS done more? In, in the regards to which, sir, exactly. In, in regards to responding and making sure that the, the VSOs, mm -hmm. um, they're during the procurement process and right. getting the funding that everything is streamlined. Yeah, I, I think. To, opposed right. to talking about it, and we're going to continue talking about yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think this. And we'll continue again to talk right. about it. So the I, I want to know the end, the bottom line is like, what, what are you mm -hmm. doing about it? We can't go back in time now. Right. But what is DVS going to do from today, moving on, moving forward? Yes. In regarding to the, C, the, the VSO complaints? Yeah, we, so, we, it, th so that very hearing and the first piloted year of VetConnect was a perfect opportunity to unearth and identify that issue is a great example the discharge status upgrades and legal services for veterans. Uh, now that we have that, it is now shifted into a priority for our office as, as they are acquired. So I'm, I'm happy that our colleagues at that organization testified and brought that to our attention. So now we can prioritize and incorporate it, um, especially into the new commissioner's vision for the agency moving forward. So how are you going to prioritize it and, um, and move, move, move forward with it? And, uh, and make sure it gets done. Adding more providers and advocating for more funding um, for those providers, sir. So do you realize there are 30 um, uh, VSOs that receive funding, right? 
And um, these uh, community-based organizations have issues with the streamlining the process, mm -hmm. uh, which currently goes through DYCD, correct? Some of it, yes, sir. And so do you know how many go through DYCD and how many go through other administrating agencies? I'll defer to my colleague here for that. Thank you for What's following? he have to be sworn in? It's Valentin Lopez, Assistant Commissioner for Discretionary. Okay, one second, let me just, let's just uh, have him swear you in. Yes, it's here. Okay. Uh, please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Um, Valentin Lopez, Assistant Commissioner for Discretionary Programs over at DYCD. Uh, currently, we house uh, nine providers with about 25 discretionary awards um, through the Veterans uh, Initiative Program that you mentioned earlier. I'm sorry, say that again. How many? We have nine providers, uh, which equals about 25 awards issued through the City Council, uh, either through the initiative or through their local awards. And that represents roughly about $700,000 going through DYCD. Okay, can you, uh, can you um, uh, give me those nine providers? Um, yes. Um, we have a listed, we have 161st Street Merchants Association, the Allied Veterans Memorial, Bailey House, Black Veterans for Social Justice, uh, Giving Alternative Learners Uplifting Opportunities, the Jericho Pro Project, Row New York, United Military Veterans of Kings County, and uh, Vietnam Veterans uh, American Chapter Number 32 of Queens. So um, these you just mentioned goes through DYCD. That is correct, Chair. Okay. And um, so how do you believe we can move forward to make sure that the funding is uh, streamlined, that uh, the VSOs don't have any issues? So currently in our uh, portfolio, um, through the 25 awards, uh, 25 of the contracts are already in process. Um, they had either one of the VSOs attended one of our workshops or they had a one-on-one -on -one session with their program manager assigned in order to assist them in the contract processing. Um, in addition to the organizations um, that haven't um, gone through the process as yet, we're still waiting for them. Some of them were just cleared on the last clear list through the mayor's office contracts, um, and we just contact them in order to begin the process. Uh. Do you, are you aware of when the uh, budget was adopted? Yes. Do you know when? June. June. And today is um, today is already almost the end of November. So do you, do you believe it's uh, uh, acceptable for these agencies who are still waiting for the funding? So there's a couple of this. So the ones that I listed, there's a few that are already in process and should be, are registered. No, that's not um, what I asked. I asked, do you think it's so I don't. I don't think so. Okay. But there's, there's also a catch to that as well, um, because some of the organizations have not submitted contracts or have not been cleared um, through the mayor's office contract process, the pre-qualification process as well. So that's also an issue. That's so right. what is uh, DBS doing about it, working with those VSOs in order to get it done, if you're aware of that? So to be clear, we haven't had any VSOs come to us and express that they needed assistance with this process, but if they did and they were concerned about their delivery of services as it relates to the contract being in effect, we would happily help them negotiate that process. But I think they are also, there, there is a complicated process with not only the city council vetting, but the mayor's office of contract services ensuring that they're within compliance. Um, so on and so forth. So if DVS is aware of a situation um, that a VSO has an issue with, you would ha you would wait for DVS to get called. You wouldn't like step we're being in proactive and with reach it. out to them. So, so yeah, when we're out talking to the VSOs and engaging them on and city council discretionary funding, the policies and procedures, if they are in that moment, hypothetically in the middle of a contract, and maybe they've been waiting a couple months and feel that they. Uh, should have had it already or are confused uh, as to why it's delayed, uh, we would happily 
go about any complaints. So how many VSOs were reached out to by DVS in regarding to the contracting issues? That would be tailored into our outreach, and I would have to get that number for you, sir. But do you have? Um, do you believe that one on one? Um, as from DYCD's point of view, all the providers have been reached, uh, have been contacted, and they've made a. No, no, I'm, ta I'm not talking about DYC. I'm talking about from DVS. Okay. Definitely more than one. Definitely more than one. Yeah. Can you? Um, how many people would reach out to those VSOs? Like how many people in your office? Uh, usually, the outreach coordinator is so primarily about seven. About seven. So, is there any way to um, to get that number before the, the end of the hearing? Like, if one of your staff members could reach out to them, just to get me that those numbers and which VSOs they reached out to? We'd have to dig into our CRM just to identify it. We well, have wouldn't some- they, Wouldn't they know? Shouldn't they know? That specific data we would just have to pull from our CRM database. Yeah, but wouldn't the seven uh, outreach coordinators know? Like if you reached out to them? Like wouldn't they know, okay, I did reach out to these Yeah, I, I'll give direction for them to recall, go into their records, but I, I can't promise that it'll be done by the end of the day, no, sir. It's, it's only seven people, right? Right. So do you have access to those seven people? Oh, I always do, yes. So can you ask your staff, if you don't mind, to reach out to them and just to get those numbers before the end of the hearing? Yeah, that's not a problem. I'll okay. do that, okay, and then right. if, I get, I, it, yeah, if so I, I get it by the end, so I'll I just want to know um, yeah. how many of them were reached out to Mm -hmm. regarding uh, the contract, yeah, and also uh, which ones. Okay, okay not great. a problem. Okay, um, now why is, why is the UICD, the administrating um, um, the, the contracts, why isn't it going through DVS? I think it's just the historical nature of us processing the discretionary awards for the city council. Um, with the anticipation and the hopes that those contracts will be moving over to Veteran Affairs? What do you mean it's gonna be moving over to Veteran Affairs? So we would think that once they got their uh, procurement shop in order and um, they're fully staffed, um, those discretionary awards will be processed over to their offices. So why isn't DVS um, um, processing their contracts? It would just uh, be an issue. You currently are processing uh, two contracts for $1.7 million, right? Right. So why aren't you processing uh, this, the VSO's contracts? We wouldn't have the bandwidth to take on that many contracts or at this time. So who does the, uh, who in your office uh, processes the $1.7 million uh, with Syracuse University and uh, Vet Connect, as well as uh, Pay Alliance for Veterans uh, Employment. Yeah, so it is a collective effort led by our deputy commissioner, and then he'll assign project leads. Um, my colleague, Cassandra, is the project lead for the Pay for Success initiative, for example. And then my one of my direct reports is the project lead for the Vet Connect NYC contract. Uh, what is the title in your office? So you have one person, so Cassandra does the Pay Your Alliance, and and the Syracuse um, University for Vet Connect, who does that? My deputy assistant commissioner handles that project. What's his name? Uh, Kwame Francis. And it's always the same people each year? Yes. Okay. Um, so they don't have, so they do other work besides for um, doing these contracts, right? Hi, so. Uh, Hi, Chair. Um, thanks for yeah, having us here. Um, so yes, uh, okay. yes. Um, so I do manage the uh, Payers Alliance for Veterans Employment contract, which is also known as the Pay for Success Initiative. I do that in consultation with our partners at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and in partnership with our administrative team at DVS. So you're ready. Um, you're ready. Um, administering con uh, contracts for, um, for a con you have a contract, of a large contract. So is it, how much more difficult it is to have the VSOs uh, come to DVS directly opposed to going through DYCD or other agencies to administer the contracts? 
Um, so we're having ongoing conversations about what that would look like for our agency. Um, at this moment, our agency is focusing on the contracts that we have at hand, which are the two you mentioned, Chair. So what are your ongoing conversations? So yeah, and absolutely. who are they with? Right. We're, we're mainly having so inter-office conversations in conjunction with OMB about what staff lines are most appropriate uh, moving into the new year. So again, um, you were made aware of these issues two years ago, and you said that you're having, you continuously having ongoing conversations. When are those conversations gonna, like, gonna end? Right, so we were made aware of the advocacy to have an ACO shop in the office, is, is what you're referring to, yes. right, sir? Um, so those conversations right now, I think we're at a place in our agency, especially considering that we have a new commissioner with a new vision where yeah. we're gonna have clarity on what he wants to do, and I just want to give him that opportunity to absorb what we're talking about. Um, as you can imagine, he's, he's pretty busy, but we're in the midst of that right now. And uh, what's your feeling? Like, what would your recommendation be to the commissioner? So, we have a few uh, administrative and operational positions in the agency um, that we have discussed would increase our efficiency, and those are what I would prioritize. Um, those positions may or may not have individuals that know about and are experts in this contracting process. Uh, they might not. Uh, I'm not sure it's a, it's a dynamic conversation at, the, at this point. But I just, I, you know, I don't want to be presumptuous and, and I want to give him the chance to really dig into that and see what he wants to do moving forward with the agency. Uh, how, long, uh, how long have you been with the EBS? About nine months now, sir. Nine months. Yeah. So you're definitely there longer than the commissioner, right? Right. So if the commissioner is going to ask you for your opinion, like would you recommend the commissioner um, to, to administer that the EBS should administer the VSOs my, my recommendation to the commissioner would be to bolster our administrative services to ensure that we have longevity um, dealing with inter-office. And how would you do that? My recommendation? Um, well, it would be continued conversations with OMB about new needs and additional staff lines. Okay. There we go. I have a lot more. Okay, I'm going to go to my, uh, to my coach here. Thank you for your question, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. We'll be back like to acknowledge that we've been uh, joined by uh, Contracts Committee member Calvin Yeager. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I guess I just want to start. So in your uh, testimony, you mentioned uh, two contracts. It appears those are the only two contracts you're currently administering through your agency, Vet Connect NYC and Pay for Success. Correct. Can you uh, elaborate on Pay for Success? Hi, Chair. Um, I'd be happy to. Um, thank you for the question. So the Pay for Success project is um, an employment program specifically for veterans with service-connected PTSD that is administered through the Manhattan and Brooklyn VA Medical Centers. Um, the program is an innovative financing model in that it leverages private funds uh, up front to start the project. Um, and then the city and the VA in partnership together pay out uh, those private funders based on positive outcomes that the program generates. Uh, therefore, the project shifts the risk from the public sector onto the private sector, and the city and the VA are only on the hook to pay for uh, successful job placements for those veterans. In terms of the actual intervention and what the program is, uh, veterans, as I mentioned, with service-connected PTSD under the age of 62 get paired with an employment specialist. That person provides highly individualized support to that program participant. They also work in conjunction with that individual's mental health care provider to uh, map out a roadmap for that individual uh, to eventually seek and get placed in a job that is uh, suitable uh, for their disability, but also compatible with their interests and skill sets. How does one access pay for success? 
Uh, through the Manhattan and Brooklyn VA Medical Centers. Uh, that is where our employment specialists, and I say our, but it, they're really VA employees, are staffed. Um, one is in Manhattan, one is in Brooklyn. Um, they each have individual phone numbers that they can be reached at. There's also information. What are the addresses and phone numbers? Uh, the phone number for the Brooklyn specialist, uh, her name is Ann Cordato, and her number is 718-836-6600, extension 6037. Um, and then George Robertson is the gentleman who works in Manhattan. He's also a veteran himself and he could be reached at 347-666-5337. We also have this information on the DVS website and we push it out over our social media. I'm on the DVS website. If I were to be looking at it at home or trying to find it, where would I find it on the DVS website? You it currently have a drop down for I am looking for. There's nothing that says jobs. It should be under the career council page. If it's not up yet, it's a, an update that we are currently in the process of making, but our team did discuss this. I, I think one of the top things folks come to me for is jobs, so I, I, it, it is not on your front page. So uh, will, will you add it to your drop down? We can absolutely do that, Chair. Uh, and I guess the, the you, it, you gave two people in two boroughs. Is there a plan to expand to all five boroughs? Um, so the individual who actually staffs the Manhattan site does travel to Queens um, to recruit veterans for the program, and as I understand it, he also does travel to the Bronx as well. The operations of the program itself are in the hands of the VA. So DVS is in a position to make suggestions, recommendations. We're also in a position to connect those employment specialists with potential employers that ultimately can close on job placements for those veterans. But as far as the program is operationalized, it, it follows the VA's framework. Dollar for dollar, how much is coming from the VA and how much is coming from the city? So the city's contract value is $750,000 of outcomes payments. Um, the procurement value for that contract is $650,000 because we've partnered with a private sector partner uh, to defray some of the city's obligation. And what, is the, what, is, what do we get from the VA for every dollar we invest? It's a one-to-one -one match. So they match $750,000 in outcomes payments. And if we don't follow exactly what they want, then we won't get the dollar for dollar match. Uh, no, that those pay that that dollar for dollar match has already been obligated by contract. So I guess the question is: Let's say we wanted to serve a borough like Staten Island. Uh, despite two of my colleagues who would like to secede, they are they are still a borough as far as I know, and I, I love them dearly. I think it's a great borough. Uh, I do too. How do we provide services to veterans in Staten Island? Uh, so the Staten Island veterans have been traveling to the Brooklyn VA uh, to access the program. Uh, the outreach that the, they're called IPS specialists, Individualized Placement Support Specialists. Those are the uh, employment specialists that I referred to before. Uh, they have been traveling uh, to the Staten Island Vet Center and, but th and there's elsewhere. But two, and on Staten Island, we, ju we have 21,502 veterans, according to our committee report. So I guess... Uh, what are their caseloads currently, and, what, and how much do the jobs pay that they can place people with? Uh, we don't have that information prepared today, but we can get back to you with that. Is that information that you're tracking for your outcomes to make sure that we're getting a good investment in return? That's correct. They are tracked as, as part of the outcomes. Um, it's also important to note that two sites were selected for this project because it is a pilot. So this is the first time the VA has ever done a project like this. Um, this is the city's second ever pay for success project. It's the VA's first. Um, so this is very much a pilot that could be positioned to scale pending positive outcomes that are generated. So that's why those two sites were particularly selected. And the IPS specialists have gone above and beyond to make sure that they recruit outside of those two uh, specific hospitals. But the program is operationalized specifically to have um, staff at those two sites for the pilot phase. Tell me a little bit about Vet Connect. Uh, so, if somebody needs resources, what's the value of the contract with Vet Connect? Five hundred fourteen thousand per year, sir. And uh, it, I, I, I'm on the Vet Connect website. There seems to be a, a veritable laundry list of services and service providers. Uh, who reimburses them 
for providing services to veterans. All those services are free of charge to the veterans, sir. So those are not for uh, those are not for profits. Right, but non for profits, the, the 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 money has to come from somewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it either comes from generous donors, and God bless those people, but otherwise it usually comes from government. I'm the contract chair of a lot of the, and, and it was in my opening, a lot of the services that the government would otherwise offer or should otherwise offer go through nonprofits. So who's paying the nonprofits for the services they are providing directly to, non to, to veterans? They have raised their own funding for that. So do, you, do, you, do you think it's it's fair to uh, lay the services that we're going to provide to veterans on the backs of nonprofits and tell them that they need to provide the funding for the veterans and that we're off the hook? Or do, what, what do you think we should do in terms of supporting those nonprofits? Those nonprofits um, offered and volunteered to be part of that program due to their capacity because they want to serve our constituency base. So at any point, if they have an issue with capacity or an issue with funding, they're not on the hook by any means. Uh, it's a relatively dynamic relationship. I, I guess where I'm going is, is there an opportunity? So, so for instance, there's on the Vet Connect, one of the projects is the Wounded Warrior Project. Right. If they have high need, is there an opportunity for the city to provide direct funding to the Wounded Warrior Project or if they are unable to meet the need, then just they're, they're out of luck and they won't get any support from here. We'll, we'll leave one of them behind. I would have to look into that, sir. But that's okay. a good point. Should, should, we, sh should the Department of Veteran Services be providing support to the nonprofits that are providing services to our veterans financially? Trying to be very straightforward about the question. I, yes. if, if I wasn't straightforward, I'm, you can let you can ask me how I can clarify. No, it just uh, areas of expertise. <laughs> just want to let her touch on that. We appreciate that, Chair. Um, so we are uh, making our one of our first forays into working with providers, um, and that relates to the announcement that the mayor made on Veterans Day around creating uh, a fund for legal services. Um, so that is our our first foray into that space. So, okay, let me, I, I'm just gonna be, try to be very, very clear. So there are nonprofits, they are providing direct services to our veterans. And you've testified that they're not getting any money from the city. And so I'm asking if you would agree that you as Department of Veteran Services can provide direct funding to the nonprofits uh, in order to serve our veterans better. I think that's going to be the subject of some internal discussion with our commissioner and some of the senior staff. I wouldn't want to answer that right away without a little more feedback and contacts from them, sir. If the commissioner can't show up in their cap so, 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 so I know I try to send people with authority. I'm an attorney. When I've gone to court, uh, I can't show up in court without authority to settle, without authority to, to move forward. Um, I, I understand in the military, generally, you, you might have somebody at the top who says this is the battle plan, but when you send somebody out into battle, you're going to send them with the ability to, to be in command and what have you. So I guess I'm, I'm, I understand your deference to, to the new commissioner, but they sent you here and they knew what we were going to ask you about. So um, I, w I would just love, even even in your own personal capacity or what you would do if you were commissioner, but just whether or not we could, whether or not having a chief procurement officer would help you with this. So I guess I'll just ask one more time, like would having a chief procurement officer help you work with the specific nonprofits to provide specific services to our, non to our veterans? And should the city be working with our nonprofits and funding them to provide more services to our veterans? I think that's really going to be dependent on future conversations with OMB, sir. It's not just about the commissioner. I think it's a, it's a bigger administration, and I want to make sure everyone's read in on that. I'm just going to be honest. This was the softball question. Uh, we, I, I'm the contracts chair. We have $16 billion in contracts, many of which with nonprofits. I think people in this audience, people watching at home, expect government to use their tax dollars to provide services to those who need them most, particularly our veterans. 
and at least for my part, uh, our, our homeless veterans. And so I'll, I'll pass it on to whoever has questions. Back to Chaim. Uh, thank you. Um, so firstly, do you have a question? No, no, no I'm good. So you mentioned uh, your pay for success program. You have a um, an outreach in, in Brooklyn and in Manhattan, right? That's correct. What borough is your largest uh, veterans population? I believe the largest population is in Queens, sir. In, in Queens. So how come there's no one in Queens? Uh, the way the sites were selected was really dictated. I, I don't know if your mic is on. Oh. Can you hear me? Um, uh, the, the sites were selected by the VA, um, and it was also based on uh, the infrastructure that those respective hospitals had to house the program. That's how the decision was made by the VA. Do you know what the outreach is in, in all five boroughs? Um, how many people you service uh, through a pay for success uh, program? We, we do have those numbers. I don't have them prepared for today, but okay. we can get back to you with those okay. with those figures. Okay. Um, you also mentioned that uh, there were 25 awards to nine providers, a uh, totaling of $700,000. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So uh, who administers the other VSOs? I believe uh, HRA has some. Uh, in accordance with Schedule C, it's HRA, SBS, HRA, DI, DHMH, DCLA, CUNY, and DHMH again. Okay. I, um, so how are, how are we going to move on from here in regards to uh, deciding and uh, in regards to a chief contracting officer if DVS um, is able to implement that in order to work with the VSOs? So what is the next step? Well, the next step is we're going to continue our current framework with the deputy commissioner as the acting ACO until a decision is made based off of our conversations with OMB. OK, so what's the next step? You're going to reach out to OMB? We're currently in deliberations with them about these positions. So that's ongoing right now. So it's ongoing right now, so what is their response to that? Um, we're waiting on that. So I know you had like several meetings and it's ongoing and you didn't hear anything from OMB? Not yet. No, well. So it didn't respond it, it's, to it's you? A, it's an ongoing maybe, conversation that we're having. I'll send it to OMB. Right, we submit our new needs requests. We no, so I, I just, one right. second. I don't want to get this hearing. I don't want to go crazy in this hearing, but I'm going to ask again. Um, what is the next step? You're going to reach out to OMB. I know you had ongoing conversations. Right. Okay. Forget about the, those past conversations. I just want to know what is going to happen tomorrow. Like, are you going to have a conversation with OMB? Are they going to respond to you? Are they not going to respond to you? Are they going to tell you, um, give you the same answers that you're giving us here today? Like, tell me what, what, what do you expect from OMB? Like, if you reach out to OMB and tell them that we need a chief contracting officer or we need someone to administer the contracts for the VSOs like and your recommendation is that you think it's important well the next step is going to be we're going to discuss the outcomes of this hearing and our advocacy groups and the discussions we're having about the chief contracting officer and subsequent positions we're then going to take the outcomes of that conversation discuss with OMB and eventually they will come back with approval or denial of our requests. Okay. But they have been, I just want to be clear. Yeah, that no, that I just want to say, yeah. we have a hearing today. Let's assume we didn't right. have a hearing today on the contracts. We had a hearing today on some unanswered questions from before, like how many veteran suicides are there in New York City. Uh, maybe we could have a hearing on something else. Mm -hmm. But let's assume we didn't have a hearing today. So for two years, and you've been there for nine months, that DVS is aware that there's an issue with the VSOs. Let's assume there's no hearing today. How is DVS going to respond to the VSOs on their issue that um, we have with DYCD or 
other contracting agencies that it's not moving quick enough and it's not streamlined, and they're asking for DVS to administer all their contracts. So how can we resolve this? And if, if we have an answer from OMB and they tell us no, then we know what to do then. You know, we know how to move forward. But if you're reaching out to OMB and they're reaching out to you and they're not responding and it's going to be ongoing issues for the next two years, then we, we don't know what, what the next steps are. Uh, so what is the next step on DVS's part? Regarding the contracts, we're going to do continue our community outreach. Should we receive any complaints that from a VSO directly, we're going to treat that with the same urgency that we treat any complaint that a veteran or one of our constituents has. We're going to work with the teams and the very smart, capable people we have in place, such as our deputy commissioner, our chief of staff, people like Cassandra, and address their needs. And if they have any issues, and let's say for argument's sake now that it's the speed at which the contract is going, that they're not getting it on time or they have any concerns, their concerns will be heard and we will attempt to remedy if there is an issue that we can correct or refer them to an agency such as MOX, who has a plethora of resources that would be able to help them out. Okay. So I just want to tell you for the record, I, I want to work together with DVS making to make sure that we work together and, you know, get things done and move forward. I'm not an enemy, so I want to work together, but when I don't get the proper answers and, and things are just not moving along, Right, then it becomes an issue. I want to work together with you. I want to work together with DVS. So, does any anyone here any is any um, a VSO who has an issue with DYCD who currently has a contract? Raise your hand. Okay, can you come up here and if you don't mind? Yeah, you could come up here. Yeah. So I just want to get one person. Yeah. Um, do we have a mic? No. Okay. So you could you could. Talks at all, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Uh, we've signed up with <coughs> DVS since they were first created. Okay. Um, we received the legal contract. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. All right. Since um, since DVS was created was created, uh, I've contacted Commissioner Sutton probably at least five times about becoming a fully contracting agency. Uh, we've always been told that if we're a new agency. We're not ready for that yet. We're not ready to take the next step. We don't have anybody who can do it. Uh, the list is as long as my arm. Um, in my office, I, I'm Chapter 32 Vietnam Veterans of America. In my office, I have four four-drawer filing cabinets that are filled with paperwork generated by DYCD in trying to administer our grants. When we do get a grant, we have to pay a conduit 10% of that grant. So if we get a $30,000 grant, we're paying $3,000. So now we've only got a $27,000 grant. Uh, I'd like to see DYCD and I'd like to see DVS, uh, initials are getting me all screwed up. I'd like to see DVS take over administering the contracts rather than DYCD. We don't speak the same language as DYCD. They're totally different from us. One, one guy from DYCD once mentioned to me that he thought PTSD was something to do with data. I, it, it's shameful. It's, um, perhaps I exaggerate on but four filing cabinets full of paperwork. Um, Every time you, you apply for a grant, there's a new class. There's more paperwork that needs to be done. Uh, chapter 32 right now is, is in jeopardy of having to close its doors because I can't get anybody to step up into a leadership position, excuse me, a leadership position because of the onerous amount of paperwork involved. We're three guys in a room with 240 members, and I can't get one guy that wants to be president and another guy wants to be treasurer because it's a full-time job. So, okay, uh, if you don't mind, if you could sit up there, stay up there. I have a question for Val Valentin. So, could, could, yeah. Could, you want to be there? Sorry. No, 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 you could sit. Yeah. Um, you have a mic? As yeah. You have a mic. You can bring that over. I'm sorry, it's just a little sorry. disorganized. Um, 
so I have a question. What does DYCD have to do with veterans? So the, the way the uh, Schedule C is designated and the discretionary funding that uh, you and your colleagues yeah. allocate are the way you designate the award. So um, we take it based on the designations made on Schedule C and also through the transparency resolutions. Uh, so those contracts come through us through designation okay. uh, through council finance staff. Okay, so that's because we really don't have a choice, right? I, I would believe so. Yeah, but the uh, um, Department of Youth Community Development really has nothing to do with the veterans, right? That is correct. That's correct. We only handle their discretionary yeah. contracts. Do you have a do you have a department in DYCD? Do you have like veterans that work in D DYCD? We have we have veterans that work at DYCD. Yes. Are those veterans assigned to the veterans contracts? Uh, in the, I would have to look at that. Um, but I the offhand, I, I would say the, no because I think in that unit currently there's uh, maybe two veterans. Okay, but then they're not dealing with um, only two veterans. Yeah, I think in that unit. Well, DYCD is a large, uh, well, small agency okay. compared to others. But uh, there's other units besides the discretionary. The discretionary portion of that uh, unit, it's about 24 people, and out of those 24, I believe we have two veterans that are part of that unit. So how many people um, in DYCD work on the veterans grants? Is well, it one, two, three? Well, you have the discretionary unit that handles all the discretionary por okay. uh, uh, portfolio. Um, you also have other shops that approve budgets. You have uh, our budget department that handles okay. uh, the award process. Uh -huh. um, we have our ACO shop who handles the registration <laughs> process. So uh, people in your office are trained, like when you get um, when you get funding for youth services, so they are trained to deal with issues and th they have the knowledge of working on contracts and understanding, you know, the youth services that the city uh, funds every year, right? They that have training? That is correct. Does your office have training on veteran issues? Through our HR department, yes, they do have uh, training for veteran issues. So you're saying that those people in DYCD that administer the funding for the veteran groups, they receive training? Yeah, I would have to take a look at this Is a yes or no? circumstance. It's or, a or yes, or we, you don't yeah. know? We have, well, I really don't know. You don't I know. would have to take a look, yeah. So you don't know? Yeah. So what's your position in DYCD? Assistant Commissioner for Discretionary Programs. Uh, assistant Commissioner. So as Assistant Commissioner, you you should know, right? I mean, if you have training and those members that are trained on veteran services, you right away would have have knowledge to s and say and answer me, oh yes, of course, this is what they do, right? Yeah, but sure. in this particular- But you're not sure. Yeah, I, I would- You're not sure. Okay, okay so, this, okay, yeah. I hear what you're saying. Um, do you see it's a problem that if a, if, um, a VSO is working through DYCD with one of your caseworkers that he or she may not have knowledge of veteran issues. Yes. It's a problem. Yes. Okay. Um, do you believe that uh, DYCD is the right, um, the right agency to administer veteran, veterans uh, funding? Again, I would say that uh, through the designation, uh, we're, we're responsible for handling the discretion. Because you have no choice, right? Yes. You really have no choice. Um, so uh, according to, um, at a March 2019 hearing, uh, former Commissioner Sutton mentioned that there will be someone in, uh, uh, in DVS who will be responsible for going, uh, for being the going between uh, for the agencies and contracts and working with community-based organizations. Does DVS, th does DVS have this individual that the former commissioner mentioned? We've identified the individual and we're working through a training plan uh, with that individual to best assist the organizations that are applying for discretionary funding in calendar year 20. So this was back this was at a, a March 2019 right. hearing. So what happened between March and, and today? It was discussions? The individual was hired in April that we intend to be the ombudsman for the agency. And what does the training involve? Like how long is the training? Is it a day? Is well, it's, it's a secondary hat for that individual, but the, the training is really putting them in touch with point of contacts at interagency departments like DYCD and establishing those relationships. 
Uh, the training involves situations that, uh, first of all, I'm, sir, I'm sorry to hear about the troubles that you're having with the contracting process, but I want to reaffirm our commitment to helping DSOs and that this exact situation is a situation where even now, despite the individual not having um, agency-directed training, um, they have the expertise uh, and the knowledge to take a situation like this and act as the liaison between this gentleman's organization and the administration and city government. Well, my question is how, like, I have opioid uh, training, right. um, I think next week, mm -hmm. so I know it's a six-hour training, so people are coming six hours, they train. How long is this training? Is it, is it a six-hour course? Is it? The training is really just identifying the standard so, operating so, procedures. Okay, so you identified someone in April after the March hearing. Right. So what happened from April? Up well, to we haven't had any formal issues where we would have had to include this individual to help negotiate or deliberate yeah, but them. You said DVS had knowledge that there were issues. We had knowledge that our advocates want us to create an echo shop, but we haven't. I you also mentioned that the seven um, outreach right. uh, coordinators are aware that there are issues. They are not aware. They've been conducting outreach to encourage VSOs to apply for discretionary funding, and if they needed assistance with that, they would have provided them with the language. Now we did mention before that um, the outreach coordinators were reaching out to see if they have any issues. Right, so and we haven't had any answer. negative feedback from that so far. Uh, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, yes, so sir. But, so if there was negative feedback, uh, we, who would they report to? We would have funneled that feedback to the ombudsman and collectively of a team. We would have worked to so remedy that it. person's that person's in the office now. So does he have any knowledge? Well, we now have very new Who's knowledge of the situation. That it's our, I, currently it's our IGA director. Is he? Is he here? He is. Where is he? Oh, so can we sway you in? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. First of all, um, yeah, let's sway you in. Uh, would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in response to council member questions? Yes. Thanks. Thank you, and congratulations on your new uh, new appointment. To Thank you, sir. Yeah. So um, you have seven uh, outreach coordinators who reach out to the VSOs. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Are you aware of any um, issues? that the commu these community-based organizations had regarding their funding cycle? Uh, I have not been made aware of that, sir, uh, but I can assure you that in understanding the plight of this gentleman, I'm sure many of the other organizations that are uh, having issues, I will be reaching out to them as well as the council to figure out the appropriate steps and point them in the right direction to assist them in their needs and understanding the contractual process um, within the city itself, sir. Is it possible that um, you seven outreach coordinators have received issues from VSOs regarding the funding cycle? I, I believe it, it's, it's, anything could be possible, sir, but I can assure you that the coordinators are under the leadership direction here at DVS. If they receive any such information, but you would know. pass that through the channels. But they would have to tell you. They would have to bring up the channels, sir, and they're aware of the, the what protocol. Are those what are out. those channels? At my line of action, specifically. So the, they report first to, to the assistant commissioner? No, so if they identify an issue in the field that requires what we call a critical care issue that they can't mitigate on site that requires some additional expertise, they'll report to that to their senior outreach coordinator, and then he'll work with my deputy commissioner, assistant commissioner who oversees that team. But so when does, it, when does it get to? At that point. So once my deputy assistant commissioner, I d is that need is identified, and it is a need that he determines is best suited in this example for the ombudsman to take on, and that example just being a VSO having issues with contracts, then we would initiate our care for that organization and individual. Okay. So you have, uh, let me just get this straight. If, if the answer is I don't know, if the answer is no, just, just say it and I'll just move on. Uh, I just want to, I don't want to go, go around in circles. So you have seven, I just want to try to understand that you have seven outreach coordinators. Yes, sir. And you mentioned before that they reach out to VSOs. They right. do, yep. 
and they would ask um, those community-based organizations, do you have any issues with your funding, right? Correct. Whether it's the, the YCD or it's HRA, whichever, whichever, whoever the administrating agency is, correct? Correct. Now, that individual, that BSO would say either no issues, right, everything is good, mm -hmm. or they would answer you or they would tell them, no, we have a problem. Right. Right. Did anyone bring up any problems or any issues with their funding process and how it's delayed and how it's and how now it's November and um, the budget was adopted in June? Through the coordinators, no. Not through, through the process. No. But it's possible that they do have knowledge, just it wasn't reported. Is that correct? No, they would have reported it up. They would have reported it. Right. Um, so you're still trying to get an answer of which BSOs they reached out to. Right. Okay. I sent that email out. Hopefully I can have it for so you So if soon. we have um, one of those uh, BSOs who I contact today and they tell me, oh, yeah, they, no one reached out to me, mm -hmm. or I call every uh, community-based organization that, re that receives the Veterans Initiative, is it possible they were telling me that no one reached out to us? Is that possible regarding um, their funding cycle and for it to be streamlined? Well, I think we're going to use this as an opportunity to now reach out to veteran service organizations and have a blanket statement of, are you having issues with funding? And then we're going to collect them and build what that outreach is going to, and partnership is going to look like. Okay, so you're going to start now? Well, now that we're given this information that someone's having an issue and very specifically this gentleman's organization, absolutely. Okay. Um, and I'll have his information before I leave today and we'll Is he continue. one of uh, the people you would reach out to, the DBS, one of the outreach coordinators would have reached out to? I'd have to check to see if they're in our system as an organization how that we've you know, reached out how, to. How difficult is it to check? We have a database that someone would have to go in and check, but I'd can have you, to access that through the office. Okay. Uh, and Chair, we also encourage uh, veteran service organizations to join us at tomorrow's VAB meeting which will be taking place at the municipal building on the mezzanine level uh, tomorrow, the 19th, 6 p.m. That's also an outlet where we can gather feedback. Okay. So I think what we accomplished today so far is that uh, DYCD is, um, the system commission is saying that, you know, these um, veteran groups should not be going through DYCD because they really have no training and they have no knowledge on veteran issues. And um, if, you know, administering these funding, the funding from, through DYCD has no, has no place, um, has no place going through DYCD. I think that's what we heard today from, from the commissioner, right? Well, I think we heard a specific example of how we can help bridge the gap of services at organizations like that as we move forward to establishing what direction DVS is going to go into as it relates to servicing contracts, yeah. sir. But this is a unique opportunity for us to collaborate yeah. with them now to ensure that. No, I understand. That, yeah. but, but for two years, um, advocates have been coming to DVS, and DVS is aware of these issues for two years. And we're still going through DYCD. So right. at, at this point, we really have no trust of anyone collaborating with DVS. So that's why we want to see if they could go directly to DVS and for DVS to have um, to have that chief operating officer, um, the chief contracting officer, so this way they could work directly with your agency so there's no middle person involved. Does that make sense? It makes sense to have, for now, uh, the ombudsman to act as that liaison, um, but I, I do want to to say that this, we are aware of two years of advocates pushing for a contracting arm in the agency. We haven't been aware, to my knowledge, of issues such as this. And I'm, I'm sorry that you've brought this up, sir. And, um, you know, um, it, it seems that nothing was done. Uh, but I promise you today, I will take your information and we'll personally address this issue. Um, had we been aware of any situation marginally close to what this gentleman or any organization had been going through for the past two years, specifically as it relates to contracts, we would have addressed it at that time, whether we had the capacity or not, just because of the greater good of our constituency. Yeah. Now, he did say he reached out to DVS, right? Say again, sir? You did reach out to DVS. Yes, sir, I did. 
Okay, so uh, I've had okay. I've met Commissioner Sutton many times. Always mention this. Uh, individuals from DVS always mention this. I would really like them to be a full contracting agency. So what's going to change if he has brought this to the commissioner's attention, to DVS's attention uh, over the last how many years? Since DVS was, was Since created. for the last three years. So if nothing was done, so how are things going to change now? So is that going to be through your job? I'm sorry, what's your name? I didn't get his name. It's uh, Vincent Garcia. Vincent. So is that going to be your job now to make sure that um, he gets taken care of and DSOs like him so that these issues will, will be taken care of? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, sir. Well, and what I can do is I, I can definitely provide you my contact information and get yours as well, and we can work from there. But I can also assure yourself, Chairman, and the other VSOs are here that okay. as part of this new role that I've taken on okay. and to assist in the actions of DVS, to not only meet with yourself and the committee to detail what's going on, but work with those VSOs to address those issues and then okay. point uh, the right partners through whatever sister agency it may be or whatever information I have uh, to determine some of the best course of actions to move forward. Okay. Is your information listed on VetConnect? And your role, your new role? It is not, but okay. I think we can we can definitely add it in this. Okay. Case. So how would someone know uh, to contact you? Like anyone, anyone here from a, a VSO? Uh, anyone here? Okay. Do you know? Do you ever meet um, Vincent? Um, I'm relatively new to my okay. uh, VSO, so I'm not familiar. You didn't have the opportunity. Okay. So how would how would uh, how would how would the community-based organizations know that they need to reach out to you? Well, we could do two things. Um, one is any anyone asking about contracts going forward um, will be defaulted to Vincent and would have been defaulted to Vincent when from when he was hired. So who would they call? Like, well, a, any any arm of the agency. Uh, if someone wanted to talk to me on the street or a, one of my coordinators. No, my question is, how would they get to Vincent? Like, like if. Well, we would perform intake with that individual or organization. They would be in our internal system, so we'd have them tracked with detailed follow-up there, but they would be referred to Vincent. So how would point. they originally get, um, like, if a VSO had an issue, so they pick up a phone, they call DVS? Is that what you're saying? How, how would yes, they? or if they're interacting with us in the field. Okay. By, so a, by any means available. So they would have to go through your your outreach coordinator. It like wouldn't you. have to. It could be any organization we bump into in an event or um, conducting any of our deliberate outreach. Okay. So we're not talking about, like, we're talking about 30, right, 30 CBOs. We're not talking about 300. We're talking about how many contracts do you have in DYCD? How many is nine? No, no, total. Oh, total. For the whole mm -hmm. city. Uh, total is 948 at, for FY20, correct. correct. So you have 948. Correct. How many people you have working sets of small agencies? It's about 24 dedicated to the discretionary okay, program. So you have 940 um, CBOs, 940, and you have 20. It's about 24 dedicated staff. 24 dedicated staff who work with these non for profits That's to. Correct. And DVS, how many employees do you have now? Our 44 total, I think we have about 40. So you have 44, and you have 30 CBOs, right? So you're actually a lot larger than DYCD, and DYCD is doing your contracting for you. Yeah, we just, we don't have the infrastructure to support taking on additional contracts at this time. So Vincent, how would you work with DYCD if they have only 24 dedicated employees with 940 uh, community-based organizations that they they work on their funding? So if DYCD is backed up with 910 of the CBOs and 30 veteran organizations are crying to you and screaming at you, how would you push the veterans CBOs, how would you push them to make sure that they're able to get the funding when DYCD has another 910 um, contracts that they may be behind on? 
Uh, well, I, th I think first and foremost, uh, Chairman, just once again, thank you for the question, sir. And, and I think it's really just communication and collaboration. It's working with the VSOs to understand what exactly are the innate issues to which they're going through, being able to communicate that to my sister agency here, and then also understand the issues that may go on your end. Um, I think in a lot of ways the, the issue comes down to communication, that there may be a document missing or something that fell through the cracks, and it's being able to address both parties and move them together because we're fighting for the common goal of assisting veterans. Assisting so you have another 910 uh, CBOs who have the same issue, documents mis missing or more documents to be filled out. So how would you push the veteran organizations ahead and make sure they get the funding right away if DYCD has already their own issues with non-for-profits, like it's not just a communication thing. No, I understand that, sir, but right. I, I think it, it, it really starts in that communication because as to if in that 900 or so contracts that um, my colleague speaks that he works on, that the agency works on, uh -huh. um, it's also being able to address these issues. And sometimes these issues can be a quick fix, and other times it's also um, assisting the VSOs. As this gentleman said before, you know, it's difficult trying to get uh, the number of people to take leadership roles, but being able to assist him in, in recognizing what those things are, how we can help as an organization, okay. and they be able to push that forward. And realistically, I think sometimes when you put things on the radar, and depending who's able to work that working relationship, uh, we can find that solution. But it's being able to work on, on both ends of the spectrum to assist those needs on one end for the VSO, assess the other needs for my sister agency, because at the end of the day, uh, we serve the people of New York, and whether it's 900 contracts or 1,000 contracts, we'll get it done. Okay, I'm glad you're saying that. Can we hear that from you, Commissioner? Yeah, I'm sorry. So can we hear that from you? So Vincent calls yeah. you up yeah. and he tells you I have issues with 30, 30 VSOs, right? Like, and uh, they have paperwork they still have to do, they have questions, so how would you react to that? So the first thing I would do is I would look over the portfolio and who, who's assigned to those, uh, those particular contracts that they're requesting information on, see what the statuses are, see if how we can resolve the issues that uh, we're facing. A lot of times it's just documents that may have been signed wrong or have not been submitted. Uh, I think those are easy fixes. I think a lot, some of the major issues about clearance and, and getting the designation of wards to the providers, it's out of our hands. It comes prior to getting to us. Uh, but the stuff that we have that has been cleared mm -hmm. and been ready to go, I think it's very easy to so work it's, with it's them. It's simple. Yep. So if, if you, um, if someone, if a CBO has a, an issue with DYCD, is there like a number to call? Yes, there is. There Who is. they call? The, there's a telephone hotline that's uh, on everyone's uh, desk as part of the discretionary How portfolio. many complaints do you get like from the end of the fiscal year to, to the beginning of the fiscal year to now? Um, I don't think it's really complaints. I, li I think it's a lot of updates. Yeah, uh, updates, like questions, are. like a lot of questions. I would say maybe two to three a day. Um, are you up to date with all the contracts? Um, when you say the 940 day. contracts that you work, they're with all that. in various stages. Some of some of the contracts have been received and in process. Some have been registered already. What is like if you have to rate it from like? I would say 10? at this point like in time, we have more than about a quarter of the contracts registered already. So you only you only have a quarter. Is that good? And well, yeah, because what happens is remember is that the good? Is remember that the clearance process. Not all the awards are designated in July. A lot of them are staggered, as you know. We're at. Uh, the fourth transparency resolution, yes. and a lot of those organizations are designated in November. Uh, we just received a, a clear list uh, this past October 31st, which had about 200 new awards uh, on there for fiscal year 20. So a lot of it has to do upfront with the designation and the clearance process, and when the awards get to us, the process for kind of contracting and moving things forward uh, is kind of routine and able to deal with any issues that come up. So. 200 just came on because of new transparency That's resolution. Correct. So you would have, let's say, 740 that was done um, when the budget was adopted. So from the 740, I, you would I, say like a quarter of that? So not again, not all the groups were designated at uh, adoption uh, of the Schedule C. Are you happy the way that that at, um, at this point where you're holding with all the contracts? Are you satisfied or you think a lot more could be, you could be I, I'm never satisfied. If you, no, no, if no, you, if no, you no. hear from my staff, I'm never satisfied with where you we're need, at. Are you in need of more staff? Are uh, we are always in need of more staff. Okay, you're always in need. So <laughs> the 24 staff members is not enough. That's, I would, I would agree with that. So if you don't have enough staff and you're backed up, right, that's what it sounds like because you need so more I staff. So I, I don't think we're backed up, Councilmember. What I think no, is. No, you need more staff. If you, if you weren't backed up, you wouldn't. 
probably wouldn't need more staff. Yeah, well, we were. Yeah, I think we would need more staff. But um, if you not, if you were if you're not backed up, why would you need more staff? So currently, what happens is the, again, like I mentioned earlier, the designation happens uh, throughout the entire year. So currently, for October 31st, we received 200 new awards, would probably take us over the thousand threshold of contracts, right? Uh, December, com uh, November will come out, and we'll have some new designations on there, um, which will increase that portfolio as well. Um, so as the designation become available to DYC, the, the amount of contracts goes up. Um, currently, right now, we're at a manageable position um, because of the designations that have been staggered. Uh, but if, let's say, all the awards were to happen at designation back in July. How many, how many, how many awards are from back in July? How many awards did you get? So back in July, I think we uh, generated about 400 contracts. So 400 was right away. Right, I think that. right away, yes. So if you, if you would have to send out a, a letter to 400 asking them the experience with DYCD, you would say all 400 will be satisfied with um, the process? Uh, I wouldn't say all 400 would be satisfied with the process. What would you say? I would probably say uh, a little more than half, maybe 80% would be happy with the process. 80%, yep. so a little more than half. So why why wouldn't the rest be happy? I think is again, because of designation, sometimes they're designated. No, no, I'm saying if, I'm talking about the 400, the ones that well, were designated right away. Well, some of those have other issues that are, uh, are uh, not up front. So they may have issues passing responsibility determination. Uh, they may have issues with documentation and being responsive to staff. Um, so that varies across the board. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'd like to um, uh, recognize Councilmember Barron, who joined us. Okay, so I'm gonna, gonna give it back to my co-chair. With regards to uh, pay for success, uh, who is currently administering that contract? Who is the city actually contracting with? Uh, so the city is contracting with, um, it's called the Payers Alliance for Veterans Employment, which is uh, a subsidiary legal entity that was created to hold the city's outcomes payments um, in conjunction with the VA. Uh, and so that's Payer Alliance for Veterans Employment, LLC. That's correct. And the contract, as you mentioned before, is $675,000, which is matched one-to-one -one by the federal government through the VA. So the full contract is $750,000. The procurement value of that contract, which is the amount of money that the city is on the hook for, is $650,000. $75,000 is being provided by a private sector funder to help defray the city's costs. According to our committee report and according to the New York City Controller's website on Checkbook NYC, the value of the contract is $675,000. Uh, that being said, one of the things we noticed when we were preparing for this hearing, and I double-checked on Checkbook just now, is that to date the contract has had zero dollars spent. This is a contract that started in December of last year, so we're, we're now almost a year later. Is that because no one has found a job through this program, or is it just that we've asked them to work without getting paid for a year? Uh, I guess, what, why are there zero dollars spent to date? Uh, those, uh, so the payments are predicated on uh, outcomes reports that are generated by a third party evaluation. So the evaluation hasn't happened yet, uh, when that evaluation does happen, the city will receive a report which will trigger our outcomes payment, and that's when the money will be spent. It will happen in this fiscal year. So it's almost a year. How often do these evaluation reports happen? Um, I have to get back to you on the cycle of the evaluations, but one, one did occur in the fall, and we're waiting for the report to come out. Okay, we've been joined by Council Member Eugene. Uh, as you as you evaluate, uh, so the next one, so that one was done in the fall. When was it done in the fall? Uh, in September. Okay, so it's November now. Why did it? Why why was it taking it more than two months to get a 
it, it's a it's a third party uh, evaluator named Westat, and they're the ones who generate the the report to us. So okay. they've done the review of the program, and then they will they will generate that report, which will trigger an outcomes payment. Do you have any information on what they found? Have we helped a single veteran? Yes, yes, there are inve veterans enrolled in the program. How many? Um, I have to get back to you with the specific numbers of that. I want to make sure that you have accurate information, but we have heard positive stories from the program thus far. We've received testimonials as well, okay. which I'm happy to share, sir. Thank you. In the mayor's management report, uh, according to the mayor's management report, your budget in fiscal year 19 is was $5.4 million. Uh, it, does that sound accurate? That's correct. Uh, and of that, how much did you spend in fiscal year 19? Did you spend all of it, or did you have headcount that went unhired, or what have you? Um, we, we're not prepared to answer that specific question, sir, but we can get back to you are with you that information. Are you shorthanded at all at your agency? Are there any positions that are unfilled? We, we do have some vacancies just from general turnover. Uh, I guess the, the reason I'm asking is it if we, we looked at the budget, and it looks like you actually got a uh, cut in your budget in fiscal year 20, so you now went from 5.4 million down to 5.3 million. So I'm just curious what impact that has and what budget you would need to see in order to have a uh, chief uh, contracting officer and what budget increases you will need in order to actually do contracting with the veteran service organizations. Uh, it's noted, sir, and I'll just have to take that back to my agency. <coughs> you mentioned in your testimony that you have a client relationship management tool. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about what that is, what software platform you're using, and how that interacts with Vet Connect, how that interacts with the uh, Pay for Success, and uh, how you came to the number for the MMR of that you were working with 2,896. Uh, veterans and family members. So our composite, uh, our consumer relationship management tool is a Microsoft Dynamics program that we built. Um, that program, every organization, every constituent or client, and every event that we attend, we uh, record it in the CRM. Everyone at the agency has their own access to the program with their own specific dashboards per line of action. Uh, for example, if we interact with uh, a client, and we refer them to Vet Connect on that coordinated care platform. They that note and that referral date, time, who they talk to, et cetera, will be recorded in the CRM. Uh, but at that point, they will enter a different database. They will then be reengaged when after they've been connected to services, or if they had an issue getting connected to services. Sir, I can speak to how um, the Pay for Success project works. So all of that client information is housed by the VA, um, and we do not receive that client information unless that person gets connected to DVS for whatever reason, for resources or for uh, support. Uh, but those, those individuals are not put into our database for privacy reasons. How, so I guess, how will we know that pay for success is working and, and when will you have me, how, how soon can you give me a number of the folks that at least were served even if their outcome hasn't been certified yet? Uh, we could do that before the week is over. We could get those numbers to you um, and we're happy to share more information about the success of the project as well once we get that formalized uh, evaluation report. I also want to note one other uh, thing that you brought up, sir, previously about the contract value. It is $675,000 that the city is on the hook for. Um, and then that is matched dollar for dollar by the VA. An additional $75,000 is coming from a private funder. So the full contract value amount is seven fifty. dollars Thank you. Uh, with so I guess one of the things is you are tracking the number in the management, mayor's manager report, you are tracking the number of people, uh, veterans and families that you're engaging, uh, but it seems like there might be disconnects. So if somebody goes directly to Vets Connect, that doesn't get in your system. And if somebody goes directly to the uh, 
pay for success, that doesn't go into your system. Well, let so, me just so jump in there with the... It may be under reporting. Well, with the Vet Connect, uh, no, because they we have a contract with IVMF, uh, a data sharing contract. So they, they push regular reporting to us uh, through a, at an as-needed basis or throughout the quarter. Um, so, and their reporting format looks much like ours. We use the same language when it comes to engaged and assisted veterans. And then um, as it relates to pay for success, you know, the evaluation of that program will provide us with numbers as well. And I guess just on the, the Vet Connect, it, when I went to the website, it generally has uh, the fact that they offer assistance with disability, but it doesn't actually say who or what or, or what have you. It just says go into our general intake and fill out the form. Is there a, a way to make sure that the Vet Connect site actually gives specifics? Uh, I, I guess one of the things is, do, do you find in working with veterans that sometimes they have a lot of pride and sometimes they don't want to take assistance? I have that problem in my district with residents who qualify for SNAP who won't apply for it. Have you ever had that occasion? Yeah, I th my coordinators um, really in, in a lot, of, and th the majority of my team has been enrolled for quite some time, and that is often an issue that we face with veterans from all war eras is that that pride and not necessarily being so vocal and willing to accept services from the city. Is um, there is there an opportunity on the Vet Connect site to actually spell out the different program? M a lot of the services that I see under your services tab, where every single other tab directs you to, there's a lot of uh, education resources, but there's no details on is it a free is it free credits is it discounted credits, uh, is it an undergrad is it a graduate like. There, there's no details. There's uh, uh, assistance. There, there's Bronx uh, Veterinary Center with a picture of a cat and a dog. So I'm imagining that it has to do with animals, not veterans. Uh, but they may have some sort of, uh, and th they may have some sort of relationship where they're willing to provide a discount for veterans who have animals. Maybe they provide uh, service animals. I, 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 there's no details. So regarding that, i uh, be more than happy to have a conversation with our providers about uh, maybe being more transparent with program descriptions, but an added vet benefit of VetConnect is, you know, they are called within a couple days and then based off of the issues that they um, maybe came in with and then additional service requests that might have been discovered in that subsequent conversation, that there is a specific coordinator tailored uh, to walk them through that process and explain what services they would have available, so as not to overload them with information, um, but tailor the needs of the program to the client. But for their own informational purposes, I agree and think that being more transparent with program services per organization is a good idea. I, I appreciate the the agreement. Uh, so, so yeah, I think it's just one of those things where I don't want to overwhelm people, but if folks saw, oh, if I go to Hunter, I could get XYZ, and I go there, folks might say, you know what, I, I don't feel bad about taking this specific resource. This seems right. Uh, and I guess the only other piece is uh, you mentioned that it might be a couple of days in terms of quality of service and even sales. Uh, I've seen that generally if somebody touches base with you, in a perfect world, you get back to them immediately. Uh, do you have any quality of service related to VetConnects where there's a specific time frame you want them to respond in? There is. The original contract, um, I, I believe, one of the program uh, tools was around 10 days, but we've lowered that to uh, it's 48 hours on average. Uh, we reach back out to the client, and then for a client to be successfully connected to services and for their case to be resolved, um, it's less than a week. Okay. I would just uh, urge that if you're doing anything more than same day or immediate, then just let people pick a time. Uh, on on the form, uh, so that they that you can manage the expectations. I'd like to pass it over to Councilmember Barron, who has a question. Thank you, sir. Thank you to the chairs and thank you to the panel for coming and sharing your information. Just one general question: What is the relationship that you have with City University with CUNY, both in terms of contractually as well as the services that are provided specifically to veterans? 
Thank you for that question, ma'am. Um, so DVS has an initiative called Veterans on Campus, uh, which is a program that enables us to work directly with the uh, student veteran administrators. Those are the folks at those respective institutions who are essentially the boots on the ground that have the strongest relationships with the student vet population. Um, so that initiative helps us in establish a relationship with those folks, helps us use them as a channel to communicate information about city benefits. Uh, so we do have good relationships with uh, the East CUNY schools. We're always happy to uh, improve them and build stronger relationships with them. Certainly sometimes those administrators turn over and so that's a uh, and fertile ground for us to create a new relationship. Um, contractually, we don't have any contracts with the uh, CUNY office um, or any of the individual schools. Um, I do know that they receive discretionary funds through uh, Schedule C for the CUNY Prove program. Um, but we do have a great relationship with the CUNY institutions, specifically the ones that have the highest student veteran population, such as John Jay, uh, BMCC, LaGuardia, Queens College. Um, and uh, we, we are always looking to, uh, again, strengthen those relationships with the other schools. So those students who are veterans, how do you know that they're veterans? Do they self-identify, or is there a uh, section on the application where they check? How do you know? Is it self-identification? Is it... Uh, we're able to identify them through their use of the GI Bill. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I have a few more questions. Um, what role does OMB have with DVS? As it relates to the new needs discussions or the yeah. intro? Um, so they are available to discuss. Um, we will submit to them what positions, salaries we think are appropriate um, each year for new needs. Uh, they will then take into account, I imagine, the larger picture of the budget and see what's realistic and we'll go back and forth with what's doable and what is not. Uh -huh. So what role does OE OMB have with uh, the veterans contracts? I'd have to follow up on that, sir. No, you kept on mentioning before you have to speak to OMB. So what what role does OMB have? With oh, as it relates to the staff lines, uh, if our agency is going to move forward with uh, an ACO or a procurement shop or not. What role does the commissioner have of DVS? I think it's important to as include. As far as uh, decision making. Yeah, I think, I, well, he, the chief decision making authority, by all accounts, for the agency, we respect and want to give him every opportunity to not only digest his new role, but to take into account what his vision of the agency is. Um, whether it's going to be continuing what we our original charter, become a more service-oriented agency, as uh, Councilmember Kalos mentioned. Um, it's all up for debate, but we just want to give him the right amount of time to, to make informed decisions, especially with something um, related to something as important as contracts and uh, adding new personnel to the office. Um, so since you're using existing personnel, right, so... Um, could the commissioner of DVS make a decision to have a chief contracting officer without even having a discussion with OMB? No, I believe that that will have to, um, perhaps could assign an individual as an acting ACO, um, but we already have an individual serving in that role right now. But for a specific staff line as a chief contracting officer, keeping in mind that they will also need a staff to be as effective as we need them to be, the commissioner would be subject to discussions with OMB just like the rest of the agency is, sir. So if DVS should um, um, should take up all the contracts, 30 contracts um, from the veteran organizations, they would have to go through, DV, uh, through OMB as well? Or would the commissioner have at uh, his discretion to okay that Uh, in, in the event that um, all 30 uh, VSOs would come over to DVS, um, the commissioner has the authority to, to designate someone as an acting um, ACO within the agency that would add a, a, effectively a secondary hat to their current job as it stands right now. 
which is why we're also stressing the idea that there's a, a team that's placed behind that. But if we were to assume the present contracts, that would just effectively add an additional half for the individuals that are currently working in the office, dealing with their current capacity. They would just add on an additional capacity of dealing with um, the procurement functions, which may or may not uh, be able to assist the VSOs because it's adding on an additional duty on top of additional duty for uh, DVS staff members, sir. So you're saying that DVS doesn't have enough um, staff to take, up, to take up the 30 uh, VSOs? I don't think it's necessarily that, sir. I think it's DVS is always actively working with um, our partners and our dues to ensure that we do what's best for the city and, and the first New Yorkers and for the VSOs. But in doing so, there are certain things in, in regards to timelines and being able to show that we can do um, the current roles that we have now in addition to the current roles that we may uh, take on overall. Uh, while we find different ways to be, I guess, proactive and flexible in doing different things, but there's always um, room for improvement and room for growth. Um, it's, it's just really figuring out where the, the next steps are and how can we work with our agencies, the council, the mayor's office, to ensure that whatever next steps we do take, they're taken appropriately to assist the veterans because we would not like to expand and then still provide or provide an adequate service by expanding. We want to sure we do everything right. And to do so, we have to um, check all the boxes and recognize that we do what, what is necessary and, and understand what those line items and, and positions are. Thank On you. top of also yeah. carrying the, the requisite space and office space to then house these individuals. Thank you, Vincent. Um, yes, sir. So are you going to be reaching out to the, to the 30 VSOs, or are you waiting for them to still call you if they have any issues? I, oh, sorry, is this on? It's on this one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, I will uh, personally reach out to them, uh, okay. Mr. Chair, as well as uh, providing you with my personal contact information in the event that they come uh, to your staff or to the members of your committee, um, and, and really just working out with there, sir. It's just it's really being, uh, being flexible and getting out there. Okay. You have all the information. Is that correct? Otherwise, my office could provide you. Uh, I believe we have all the information, but I'm always helpful to receive what you have, sir. It's, it's best to have a contingency to, to double check and move forward. Great. Okay. And um, uh, Commissioner, thank you so much. Assistant Commissioner, thank you for being here today. Thank you for your and questions, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Cassandra. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, all right. I think no more questions. Any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you can stay there <laughs> if you want. You want to use? Yeah, you, you want to sit there? You can sit there. <laughs> like a physical therapy room. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I think you're you already time. testified, right? Yeah. Michael, you're done. You already testified, yeah? Uh, okay. So. So James Fitzgerald, Alan Singer, yeah, it's fine. Komatsu, Mr. Komatsu, you can come up. It's fine. And James Wilson. So first, I just want to thank you for, um, well, thank you all for taking the time um, to be here today and testifying. Okay, we'll go clockwise. Yeah. Please stop.
Uh, yeah, you could begin. Um, thank you, um, Chairman Deutsch, and the rest of the members of the Veteran Committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is James Wilson. I'm the Interim Executive Director of Gallup NYC, also known as Giving Alternative Learners Uplifting Opportunities. I'm glad to be able to be here today to share our thoughts on the contracting process for our veterans programs and to share some of our insights on the challenges and opportunities that can be found within the contract implementation process. Gallup NYC has always felt very strongly about the benefits of therapeutic horsemanship for veterans in New York City. Thanks to the support from the City Council and relationships within the veterans community in, in New York City, we have made great strides towards expanding and enhancing our veterans program over the past several years. We are excited by the prospect of serving more veterans in NYC and excited by the prospect of de developing and executing different programs that fit the needs of different veterans and the needs of their families. However, in order to successfully work with veterans, we must collaborate with an agency that specializes in the needs of veterans. Gallup NYC has been working with the DYCD on our contract implementation. As you're aware, DYCD is an agency that does not exist explicitly for veterans. Their mission is to engage the constituents of a community and focusing on youth is their priority. Our contract management and implementation with DYCD has involved primarily conversations that are technical. These conversations surround current limitations on contracts, such as vendor or consultant approval or how expense reports are filled out. We would like to engage with an agency of oversight on a very substantive level with a relationship based on, a, on collaboration and guidance and not simply structure and process. We feel strongly that such a relationship will allow Gallup NYC to continue to offer programming that fits the needs of veterans in New York City today and as th those needs change in the future. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, James, and I want to tell you, um, Gallup NYC, amazing, amazing organization. You guys don't horse around, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I hope you, I hope you're going to take uh, uh, Vincent's number, and uh, you get it from uh, from Joe Bello, and please give us the feedback of your experience working now with Vincent regarding to uh, your contract. So yeah, yeah. So please uh, get, let us know. Yeah, my good friend here. Something. Now. Um, I'm not a great public speaker. Um, I've had conversations with Ben Kellis previously about uh, my attempts to get legal assistance. I have a federal lawsuit against the city that I've apprised you about. Um, let me just use this video, I guess, to be my pr testimony. Sorry. What is your agency of doing business with a company that stole my pay five years ago? Let me rewind it. that has multiple contracts with different New York City agencies. So just as you did with Wells Fargo, can you commit to terminating New York City's business with that same company? What's the name of the company? NTT Data. I'm not familiar with that. Are you looking at that? You're looking at the Sullivan Agreement. That may be true. I'm just not familiar with the company. I said about an hour ago that I would look into it and see if we could find out. He, he will do what he says. And can he work to try to resolve this litigation I have against his agency? for not doing uh, what it's well supposed to do? That's an issue for the law department, I take it. And once there's litigation in play, the law department makes decisions about how to handle it. And we have a lot of litigation, and that's how we do things. And um, can you arrange for me to be granted an interview with one of your agencies as a U.S. Navy veteran? It depends on everything in the normal personnel process. So I want to be very clear. We follow the personnel process regardless of someone's background. We have a special appreciation for veterans, and we have special accommodations under certain conditions. But the personnel process is still the personnel process. So, Mr. Banks, the mayor said I could talk to you at the end of the meeting. Sorry, but he won't talk to me. He's talking to me. Oh, I, I didn't I know. Mr. Tomaso, you send me an email a couple times a day. Yep. Not a couple days. You don't, you don't accept the answers that we give you. So, the best thing I can tell you to do tonight is I'm not going to keep going around telling you the same thing I've told you every time. I just have one question for you tonight. You have to say every time? No, seriously. I'm going to ask you to speak to our conditional The only service. question I have is this. This is the evidence packing in my hand. Hey, Steve, how you doing, brother? Good. You can
I had a hearing with. I have a question for you. I had a hearing, a fair hearing with HRA on Monday. HRA had a legal obligation to give me the evidence packet prior to that hearing. What I have in my hand is that evidence packet that I got after. Did tell you to give that to me? No, he told me to talk to you about it. Okay. So the point is, if HRA had a legal obligation to give me the evidence packet prior to the hearing, why is it that I got it after it? Did you, isn't there uh, some attorney's numbers on there for you to call? Ladies That's not the point. Yeah. We're asking people, can you step up and talk Yeah, sure. So, is that just, <laughs> it's really this simple. Yeah, I'm sorry, your name again was? Kenny Charles. Um, so yeah, take my number, 929-221-721-7209. And the other question really is this, and I'll try to keep it at a maximum of two questions. Um, who provides oversight in my building? I live at 802 Fairmount Place in the Bronx. That's why I want you to call me so I can write all that stuff down while we're talking. We've met before. And I, I know, but I don't you know. It's been a while since you've engaged. But, I mean, bottom line is I had three hearings like, for like, litigation purposes in the last right. two weeks. Right. HRA had a legal obligation to give me. Like, well, we had well, did we represent you? Well, I mean, were we there at each one? Uh, no. Um, basically, I needed to prepare. Just like, you know, if you're going to take a test, you yeah. need to study before right. you test. Right. So you, you, guys, you guys didn't give me the material to, to study before the test, even though you had a legal obligation to do exactly that. Okay. So the question is, is I'm in the office tomorrow. 7.30 to 9. Right. 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Right. I got to go to a meeting that. Why don't you call me about 8 o'clock? And, oh, are you guys going to be having a town hall in uh, the Bronx or anywhere? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. The mayor, the mayor makes the call to the town hall. We don't. Okay. Um, call me in the morning. Oh, just uh, yeah, sorry. I just remember. There was someone outside. I live in the housing for military veterans. Right. I someone that. who's uh, was throwing a knife at the window like about two or three nights ago. So the question is, where's the signal? Are you all out? waiting for a photo? No, no. Okay, wait. would you mind moving to the well, side? Again, I don't mean to be an, I don't mean to be an a hole to you. I'm, you know, no, no, I'm but to go if in. someone's throwing a knife at the building, there's no security. Where's the security? Well, then you should. Well, well unless the uh, security knows there's someone throwing a knife in the building, no, there's no know. security. You no should call them. Call NYPD. No, there, there's always going to be the urban pathways. Call NYPD. I got assaulted, and NYPD didn't do anything about it. You can't cover all the agencies. No, I had a roommate. Well, if roommate you called me in the morning, yeah. between 7.30 and 9, yeah. at that number, I'll write all that stuff down and make sure the right people get it. I've heard that before, but I don't well, really... I so, bottom line is this. Um, like I said, I have a federal lawsuit. The judge has issued a decision on September 30th in my favor. It's proceeding to discovery. I got an email last night from the law department based saying we're not going to comply with your discovery demands. Um, the mayor is having a public hearing at 12.30 today in regards to legislation uh, pertaining to labor rights. Um, actually, HRA is doing business with a company still stealing my pay from seven years ago. I talked to the mayor. You saw the video from July 18th. Taxpayers are paying for those contracts at the same time I'm still being victimized by wage theft. So today's hearing is about veterans' contracts. Um, also, with regards to legal assistance for veterans, um, HRA had a public hearing in regards to legal assistance for veterans. They said that if you want to see the proposed contract with your MQL prior to the hearing, you can come to our office at 150 Greenwich. They won't let me into the building to see those contracts, any contract whatsoever, with my own two eyes. And they're using a fraudulent pretext to try to justify that. So I guess if you're a lawmaker, if you know we all have you know First Amendment rights that I guess we honored to be defended when we're in the military. What can you do about that? Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, what's the ex what is the exact name of the provider? Uh, which one? The, the one that with the with the contracts with the city. Um, well, there's certain contracts where the most where the parties are most at home. That's the one. They committed a breach, but they can take the money from you. Mm -hmm. um, and the HRA actually can provide legal advice. I've got HRA records that are issued and compiled by the law department. So. The, the, you were concerned about the somebody who had a contract with the city that ha owes you back pay? Yes. Uh, um, I can't give data. The only thing that's asking me for a letter is what you sent me. Uh, the what is the first letter? Okay. Uh, 
and it, it, what are you hoping to gain from the, what, what insight would you believe you would gain? That is a fair question. So we, I, I found NTT Data Incorporated, um, and and we can pull the contract, and I'm I'm happy to hand it over to you. I just, I'm not, to the extent. Oh, you do. Sorry, the thing I was hearing was that you said you tried to go inspect the contracts and you weren't able to access them. Yeah, that was about to Uh, what what is the specific con who who is the contractor for the HRA body cam? Um, that's not specific. Okay, and if we pull and and, and and just no, I uh, we we were if so, I'm interested particularly in issues of public access to contracts. It's guaranteed by the city charter, so they they are violating violating your rights and under the city charter. Uh, so that I'm taking that seriously, and in terms of the specific contracts you're interested in having access to, I'm interested in pulling those for you. I I I understand, and uh, I think the thing I've heard from DOI when I've reported folks is just that uh, incompetence isn't always criminal. Mm -hmm. uh, so. But they also gave me the payroll records and home address information for HRA's own employees that I made complaints against. So in, in terms of data security, where is Got it? Got it. Okay. Uh, so we'll try to figure out which things we can get for you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Good, uh, good afternoon, Council. Um, my issue doesn't have to do with the contracts or any of, of that. And um, I just would like to say that as a veteran, uh, my thing today is uh, the Fair Fares program. Um, as a veteran and as a New Yorker, I have not been uh, invited to partake in the, in the program. And it's been 10 months since the program has rolled out. And I understand that like 90,000 people have been invited and are currently using the program. And uh, I'm just extremely frustrated that um, I've not been invited to partake in the program and I have to get to appointments and to the VA and to doctor's appointments and look for, I look for as I'm also unemployed, and look for work. And it's difficult without, without car fare. Okay, we could definitely, uh, firstly, we could take, we'll take your information and we'll find out because um, the, Fair fares are for all low-income New Yorkers. Yes, sir. And if you're not employed, then you should you should be uh, receiving it. So I have my um, citywide coordinator here, Joe Joe Bello. Was here, but we'll put you in touch with him, and we'll make sure that um, that you get on uh, the fair fares list. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. So. Thank you, Council. Yeah. So we'll have uh, I'll have someone come down, uh, either my staff, uh, Tova, or my deputy chief of staff or Joe Bello. Yeah. And I want to thank you. Thank you for being here today and yeah. listening to the hearing. Your pleasure and thank you. Yeah. And in the in the future you could always um, contact my office you, or you could just walk up um, to the uh, 250 Broadway, eighteenth floor okay. and just walk into my office. Thank okay. You. You're always uh, invited and you're always welcome to come. Thank you. As uh, all veterans. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Chair Deutsch, Chair Kalos, and uh, committee members for this opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is James Fitzgerald. I served nine years in the United States Army as an infantryman with deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I received the Purple Heart and was medically retired due to injuries sustained during combat in Afghanistan while serving with the 101st Airborne. 
I am newly appointed as Deputy Director of NYC Veterans Alliance, a member-driven grass policy advocacy and community building organization that advances veterans and families as civic leaders. We work with community organizations across the NYC metro area to promote events for veterans and families posted online at ourveterans.nyc. Our year-round online resource hub visited by more than 4,000 users each month. We also remain the only organization dedicated to local level advocacy for veterans and families here in NYC. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to present testimony before you today. There are two key issues we wish to bring to the attention of both committees regarding contracting capabilities within city government to improve the lives of veterans and their families. First, ensuring that the NYC Department of Veterans Services has the capability of managing contracts within the agency. We strongly support contracting capability housed within, housed within the NYC Department of Veterans Services. As we have stated in previous testimonies, before the Veterans Committee and discussions with Chairman Deutsch over the last two years, we strongly urge the Council to support and fund a dedicated Agency Chief Contracting Officer, ACCO, with specialized expertise in the City's contracting and, pro and procurement policies housed within DVS. We believe DVS will be enhanced by an ACCO with the right expertise, relationships, and sense of urgency when it comes to serving our veterans community. An example of why this capability is so needed in-house is the long delay that took place during the first three years prior to DVS bringing Vet Connect NYC under agency management. In-house contracting and procurement expertise would likely have mitigated many of the issues and delays that occurred, which we hope to never see again. We urge the council to ensure DVS has no delays on establishing and managing contracts going forward, as this is, nece as this is a necessary function for any as this is a necessary function for any independent agency within city government. And ACCO would also bring the capability of providing meaningful oversight for discretionary funding from the council to organizations serving veterans based on their expertise and knowledge of the veterans community. As you are aware, discretionary funding awarded to numerous organizations across the city for the purpose of serving veterans and families are currently overseen by agencies with little to no cultural competency competency in veteran services, such as the Department of Youth and Community Development and Small Business Services. At a minimum, community organizations receiving discretionary funds from the Council to serve veterans and families should be a part of DVS's Vet Connect NYC network for those services they provide and be a robust part of the city's growing support network for our veterans community. Second, prioritizing veteran-owned businesses and city contracts in city contracting. Going back to 2015, we have many times called upon the council to establish priorities for veteran owned businesses along the city's goals for contracting with minority and women owned businesses uh, and enterprises. In recent years, city, state and federal government have invested greatly in veteran entrepreneurial program, programs from NYU Veterans Future Lab to Bunker Labs and many other great programs. Yet the opportunities and assistance for veteran-owned businesses with lucrative city contracts simply have not been open and available. Precedents for contracting preferences with veteran-owned businesses exist in federal and New York State government in many cities, including Chicago and Los Angeles. Support their veteran entrepreneurs by prioritizing them in government contracting. We again urge both the Contracting and Veterans Committee to go beyond thank you for your service to our city's veteran entrepreneurs. Veteran-owned veteran -owned businesses could be included into the existing program for minority and women-owned businesses. Potentially, our city's agencies could work towards the larger goal of prioritizing women, minority, veteran, business, uh, business entrepreneur prior women, minority, veteran, business, entrepreneurial pri priorities, and city contracting. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Pending your question, this, this concludes my testimony. James, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And first of all, thank you for your service. Thank you, Chair. Okay.
Um, and congratulations on your new role at the at Veterans Alliance. I'm looking forward to working with you and to working on these issues that you mentioned here um, to make the MWBE and uh, veteran-owned businesses to making that a priority. And um, so we looking forward to working together with you. And I'm sure you know uh, Joe Bello, who's Absolutely, really an yeah. amazing, amazing uh, individual and who's a veteran himself. So, mm -hmm. you know. Oh, yeah. We go way back. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions? No. All right. So uh, I want to thank you all once. Oh, we have, um, she snuck in Rhonda. Welcome back. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. And I heard you have a, um, a great representative in the city council. Yes, so Ben is my <laughs> representative and I'm proud to be in his district. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about my service as a veteran's financial coach. And the new development is that I was uh, offered a grant from the Bob Woodruff Foundation. So I'm now working part-time uh, at the CUNY campuses, 12 CUNY schools, that I'll be doing financial coaching for student veterans. I'd like to expand the program. For now, Prove is only on at 12 schools. But I'll give you an example of the day that I have coming up on Thursday. Starting at 9 a.m., I'm going to be speaking one-on-one -on -one with a veteran every half hour. So for that day, I'll be speaking at least 10 student veterans, helping them with their finances, budgeting, uh, credit card, any kind of personal finance issues. In addition, I'll be doing a seminar during lunchtime with about 25 veterans showing up, student veterans showing up. So in one day, I'm going to be helping about 35 veterans. I'd like to compound that multi on a multitude of CUNY campuses and all over the city for that matter. I'm also in the uh, process of um, working on a contract with a nonprofit, again, doing financial coaching. But I need to do more. I can do more. I've been a, vi a financial coach for three years, and I want to continue to do it in the city. So when there's discretionary funding, I'm requesting that I can get a lot more to um, you know, what's available to me. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for everything you do. I'm going to we're going to continue I supporting uh, CUNY in the Proof Program. I just want to ask a quick question on that. So I asked the Department of Veterans Services about who pays for all the services provided through Vet Connect. And they said, well, we spend $514,000, and then the nonprofits are on their own. Uh, is that the right attitude, or should the city be trying to support the nonprofits directly so that you can go from serving 20 or 30 in a day to being able to serve 6,000 in a year or more? Uh, just for background, I was on VetConnect when I was with the nonprofit. When I was under a federal contract through the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, is it administered by the nonprofit? So I was on VetConnect. Um, when the contract ended, I could no longer be on VetConnect. So therefore, the services that I was providing for hundreds of veterans went away. Um, so in terms of funding the nonprofits directly, that would probably be a better route. In other words, to get to get people like me to provide more services. Thank you. Thank you. And also, um, we should be working closely because I'm hoping shortly that we can be able to get um, the half the fair fares, uh, half fair metro cards to to all 12,000 student veterans. So this is something you could add on t when you speak to the veterans regarding. I'll mention that. Right. Yeah. I'll, I'll mention that this week. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, once again, I want to thank you all for um, staying through the hearing and testifying today. And I want to thank all the advocates uh, who are here today and uh, stuck around. And thank You're you welcome. too. This hearing is now adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>